Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our study on uh, the lines simply presented. And in this study, uh, we're going to be um, <clears throat> uh, addressing uh, the lines more simply than I have been. I've tried to simplify it, but I tend to get too deep. So we're gonna just try to uh, do this a bit more simply. Uh, but before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful um, for the light that you have given us. We ask, Lord, that as we look at the lines again, that your Holy Spirit can speak to us and to each person watching these videos and studying these things. Uh, we need an understanding of your word. Um, we need uh, to be able to have your power in our lives that's given through an understanding of prophecy that we can have the conviction and the power to overcome sin, to trust in you. And we pray that um, the time we spend here uh, this afternoon will be truly a blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so in uh, the first three studies, um, I had, you know, set up the basic idea of line upon line and that we need to uh, uh, set events on a line from here to there. So that is set in order on a line. That's Isaiah chapter 28. And um, along with that, we have the plummet, which is uh, these way marks that occur on a line. Those are righteousness. And the line itself is judgment. And then we uh, looked last week at darkness. So we looked at how darkness uh, precedes a reform line. And some verses to that effect, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Uh, we see this in Isaiah 60. So that was Isaiah 9, verse Verse 2, this is Isaiah 60, verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. And of course, it starts out, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So the idea of a reform line is this is... Um, God's work in restoring the image of God in man. And when we look at a reform line, one of the things I've been emphasizing is that the light that we receive uh, addresses the particular darkness that um, we have experienced. So, um, so what I want to address is, is this increase of light. So we have this darkness and we have an increase of light and how that light comes. Um, now, we looked at some verses last time dealing with the darkness. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But we know that <clears throat> this light that, that we receive, especially in the line of Christ, uh, the darkness, the people that sat in darkness saw a great light. That's quoted in Matthew 4, verse 16. So Isaiah 9, verse 2 is quoted in Matthew 4, verse 16. Um, so I'm just going to read this. Jesus begins his ministry. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, and the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, Beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So we can see that this, um, in this quote, <clears throat> there's lots here that you know we we often skip by, but I'm just going to Isaiah nine itself, 
Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shine. So here they talk about dimness rather than darkness. Um, but we can see the idea here, right, in the first part. Now, the people walked in darkness, but dimness shall not be such as was her vexation. So what is that? Nevertheless, dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. What is this referring to? What's the vexation? Because often we don't have a complete uh, context when we read these verses. So Isaiah chapter 9 is written in the context of Isaiah 7 to 12. And Isaiah 8.22, this is the chapter dealing with uh, the Assyrian invasion. So this is talking about their captivity in the, in the initial context, correct? So this would be the Assyrian invasion. Yeah. Okay. But, we, but it's applied to Christ. So, so this whole Syrian invasion and their deliverance from captivity, from both the Assyrian captivity and later the Babylonian captivity, are typifying what Christ is going to do. So, I mean, we can look at these things in the past and they can give us information for the present. Um, so, what's that? Is this... Uh... Applying to a future reflection rather than something that has passed? No, because this, well, maybe, maybe it's possible. But if you read, because um, we don't have time to read all of this, um, but you know, part of the part of the problem that we have when we read these prophecies in Hebrew. Uh, there is no past, future, present tense in the way that we have it in English, right? So they have just a completed tense and the imperfect tense, so a perfect and an imperfect tense. So something either is completed or it's incomplete, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's future because it's incomplete, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's in the past because it's written in a complete tense. To so something that's certain will be spoken as if it's already happened. And something that's incomplete um, is is open to... Um, Future interpretation? Well, so if you were going to say um, uh, they will, right, um, that still could be something that was passed. So it, it's a little bit confusing, especially when you're talking about prophecy. It's almost like the past is the future and the future is the past. But yeah, I'm just yeah, yeah. I'm trying to sort of place it. It's saying it's seven this is seven forty two BC. Um so I'm but, just trying to trying to think of it. Is there something in the past that's happened that uh Zebulun and Naphtali's already been affected? Oh well they were affected already by the Assyrians first. Okay. Right. So have so, they been afflicted? Were they taken over by Assyria at this year time then? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So it, when he at first lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Right. <clears throat> and after. Okay, so when, 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 when was that? When was that? What's that? When? What, what sorry? How long ago would have that happened? Uh, it's just been a few years. So this has been, um, because what, what you see happening with, um, you know, maybe 10, 20 years, because uh, what you see happening with northern Israel at this time, because uh, remember Hoshia, 
Uh, there's a nine year um, uh, interregnum, a period where there is no king in Israel mm -hmm. or he becomes king because Northern Israel already has largely been um, over, you know, under the, the control of Assyria. Right. So Hoshea pulls together uh, Northern Israel, so to speak, um, when he comes into power. But his and what he does is he makes this uh, um, okay, so this is going to be, let me think here, I'm getting this all mixed up. So this is going to be the time of Ahaz, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, it's it's going to start in the time of Ahaz. So when Hoshea comes into power, that's going to be about 19 years later. So it's going to be about 10 years later. And so this mm -hmm. is about 10 years before 450, uh, 742 BC. So about in the 750s, somewhere, that Assyria is already um, breaking down northern Israel. So... Uh, Who would be king then? Would be Jeroboam, would it? Or? Um, uh, well, the king that's... Uh, no, the king is going to be... Um, uh, Jotham. Uh, I mean, you're talking about for northern Israel? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's going to be uh, uh, Pekakiah is, or Pekka. I think it's uh, I think it's Pekakiah. But but northern Israel is already falling apart under those kings, right? So Hoshea managed to bring them together for a time, right? And then he's taken captive. So so this. All through this period, northern Israel is is just hanging on to its kingdom, its territory. So it's going to first start there. I can't remember all the details of it. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we have this, this period where it's referring about what happened, this darkness that's already afflicted them. And we're going to have another darkness. But it says, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath light shined. Now, now, so light has been coming to God's people, but this light that's going to be coming, they're still looking at it as, as future. So th this is a rather complex series of chapters, which probably one day we will have to study in more detail. Um, so, yeah, so I think before Hoshea, it's probably been about 20 years or so, nine years where there's no king. So maybe even more than that, probably about, might even be about 30 years where there's this period where northern Israel is being attacked by Assyria, but not all of Israel. Right. So there's different parts. Anyway, <clears throat> we always apply this to the time of Christ. Right. Because of. Um, yeah, it's in the days of Pekka, king of Israel came Tiglath Pileser, king of Syria. So there it is. It's in the time of Pekka. OK. So in Matthew four, verse 16, though, they're going to apply this to the time of Christ, not Matthew uh, yeah, so the people which sat in darkness saw great light, uh, talking about the prophet Isaiah. And then we also have other verses which we looked at as well. John, in John chapter 1, <clears throat> we have this uh, aspect of creation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was, was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we know that after this, you have darkness, you have light. We see this in creation, in the days of creation. We see this here in this history. Um, and so... When we have a period of darkness, we're going to have a reform line because God is going to take his people who are in darkness and give them light. 
we can apply this on an individual level and we can apply it um, on a national level. We can apply it on a prophetic level dealing with, with churches, um, with kingdoms. Uh, so wherever there is a reform line, it's preceded by a period of darkness. And then we have an increase of light. And, and we see that, of course, in the creation story. God says, let there be light. There was light. And then you're going to see this, the, the separation of the light and darkness. You're going to see the separation of the sky and the, and the land. You're going to see the separation of, of, or the water, I guess. And then you're going to see the sky and the water, the firmament above, the firmament below. And then you're going to see the separation of the land and the water, the seas and the water. So you have all of these separations that occur in the story of creation. And all of these are typical of the work that goes on in the individual lives, but also happen in a reform line. So uh, we're going to go to the whiteboard here. I find a little bit awkward going to the whiteboard in that I don't have the computer in front of me to read different verses. So if people can read some verses um, when I ask them to, that'd be good. So, okay. I'll do it that way. Hopefully that works. <clears throat> so can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, the sound's fine from here. Okay, so it's a simple idea. We have darkness. Now, the primary line that we, we normally use is Millerite history. And we're going to have an increase of light that's going to begin in 1798. And this increase of light is light that responds to this darkness. So what is the darkness in this period here in 1798? Papacy. Okay, so this darkness is the papacy, so we'll call it papal darkness. And what is papal darkness? Man's philosophy. Sorry, Stephen. What were you Deceptive there? teaching. Okay, so um, deceptive teaching about the word of God. The word of God is obscured. How's that? Does that make sense? Yeah, so you, you're not really sharing the right screen. I'm not? Okay, so um, let me see if I can do this. Well, it's, it's fine on my recording, but uh, let me see if I do this. I see two screens, which is fine with me too. Oh, now I see one. Could we add great cruelty to papal darkness? Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's just that the screen is showing your camera in front. You're sort of, that was sort of like right in front of the screen. What's that? Yes, that's, that's fine now. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, I was trying something different here, so I'm going to have to go back to my old setup. Okay, so we have the word of God is obscured, and we have this papal darkness. Now, we know that it's obscured through, through this type of philosophy. So what happens in 1798? Pope Pius VI is taken captive by, by uh, General Berti. Okay, so Pope Pius VI, he's taken captive. Now, how does that help anything? 
And he lost his estates in Europe. Okay, but, but as far as the reform line is concerned, why is Pope Pius being taken captive? What is that doing? It's secularizing the nations. Okay, I'm thinking more prophetically. So if I go like this, right? So we have a, a, a time prophecy that's fulfilled, right? It's ending yes. the papal reign and yeah. uh, the a, a kingdom of prophecy. Okay, so we have this 1260 years ends. The main thing to know is that this is an end of a prophetic period. And why is that important? In the context of the increase of light. I have a time of the end without a prophetic period. Time of the end. I need that prophetic period, don't I? Well, certainly in this case, but I'm not too sure whether there's been other reform lines where there hasn't been a time prophecy attached to it. I haven't found one, a major reform line. I mean, we do have, you know, reform lines that are parts of reform lines that are zoomed into, but I can't think of a major reform line that doesn't have a time prophecy. I mean, maybe we could argue that, you know, the first reform line, uh, the one that starts with God says, let there be light. Um, I don't know of a time prophecy that precedes that. But that's the time of the beginning. So it's a little bit different. Um, but the reform line of Noah, does that have a time prophecy? You have the 400 years and 430 years. Um, well, that you're thinking of, um, that's going to be the Exodus. Right. Well, sorry, what, um, what was this? I'm talking about sorry. with Noah. Oh, sorry, Noah. Yes, yeah, so you have 120 years. Now, the 120 years, though, the interesting thing is that doesn't start the reform line per se. Um, but you do have the symbols attached to, um, you know, for instance, you have uh, Lamech, Enoch, and, and uh, Methuselah having symbolic time attached to them. And then we're given the 120 years of Noah, right? So that becomes um, an important symbol, right? All of those symbols, 120 years. So in the story of Noah, sometimes we call that the first time prophecy. And with it is attached all of these symbols that are going to be used later in time prophecy. Right. And then when we get the flood itself, it's going to give us more symbols in the dates and the spans of time. But yeah, so when we look at major reform lines, um, you know, the Exodus has the 430 and the 400 and the four generations attached to it. Uh, definitely the Babylonian captivity has time periods attached to it, as does the reform line of Christ. So any major reform line is going to have a prophetic time period attached to it. But also, um, even when it's not a major reform line, there's often symbolic time attached to it that can be seen afterwards. But the idea here is that you have a fulfillment of a prophecy. So why is that important as far as the increase of light is concerned?
you have something unsealed. Okay, so Jesus said, I've told you things before they come to pass, that when they come to pass, you may believe that I am he, right? We have a prophecy, and, and the light of God's word is shining upon this darkness because of a fulfillment of prophecy. Can we see that? Because if God's word is not predicting this, there's no way that light can come here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we have an increase of light, but that increase of light comes from a series of events that have been prophesied. So prophecy, we have a more sure word of prophecy where you do well to take heed as to a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, right? So we, we read that verse, but we can see that it's talking about a reform line because light is going to shine into darkness and it's a more sure word of prophecy because we can experience things in our personal lives. We can see Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration as Peter did, if we saw that like he did. I mean, but he says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Prophecy is more sure than just to see something or witness something. It's much more objective. Now we also know uh, we're gonna have Miller here. Now what happens to Miller in 1798? Now. This is going to be February 15th, by the way. Uh, now, Miller, uh, in 1798, he's going to get a concordance, right? Yes. Okay. Now, we don't know if he got the concordance for his birthday or not, um, but he's 17 years old, right? I think he's 16. 16? Okay. Um, yeah, 16. 16? Okay. So, I mean, it's pretty possible that he got his concordance for his birthday when he was 16. If we don't know that, I'd have to see if there's a date written in his concordance. I just don't happen to have it here. But February 15th is his birthday, and the Pope's going to be taken captive on his birthday. Now, why is that important? Why, why would we note this? Are birthdays important in the Bible? Well, I mean, we I'm talking parents. about birthday parties. What? Well, I suppose it, it does count the years of like Noah's life and so forth. Right. So, so these anniversaries or these bone days, right? These are things that we we count. So, like Noah, for instance, they're counting the the events of the flood in relationship um, to the to the birth of Noah, the dates, you know, the the second month in Noah's six hundredth year, the first day of the first month in Noah's 601st year, things like that. Um, so I think there's some significance here is that this, uh, this age that he is um, becomes a symbol, that he's, he's, he's 16 on the day that the Pope is taken captive. Now, we know that it takes time for Miller to come to study this concordance, so he gets a concordance, but he's 16. Uh, as he, you know, gets older, he, he starts to buy into the ideas of deism. He might have been a Christian here at this point. But as time goes on, he becomes a deist, which is just the idea that God exists, started everything, but doesn't really have any interest in your personal life or what's happening in the world. He's just sort of an abs absentee landlord, right? Um, so, so he doesn't have an idea of a personal God, but he's going to be on, on this date here. So, um, so there's this date that's going to show up. 
and another date. And well, I guess I'll put these dates in here. So you're going to have uh, 1814, 1816, and 1818. So there is three dates there. What happens on 1814? The Battle of Plattsburgh. Okay, so we have a battle of Plattsburgh and this is going to be on September 11th, right? I'll put it over here. We we'll call it 9-11-1814, right? And then what's going to happen on 1816? It's going to be on the anniversary. Same. This is what anniversary. Well, it's, uh, they're going to have a ball. Okay. An anniversary, but that's cancelled. Yeah. And the uh, mother begins to study the Bible. Right. Which uh, anniversary? So they have this anniversary celebration, but it leads to Bible study. And and then we're going to have in 1818, we don't have a date there, but he's going to predict 1843 for the second coming. Right? <clears throat> Now this we call uh, an increase of light or an increase of knowledge, right? So this is an increase of knowledge. Now this starts with a prophetic event. And William Miller is going to understand this event as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So without this event, can William Miller have an increase of light? Can he begin a major reform line? No. No, right? Because he needs this these prophecies being fulfilled in order to understand what's happening. Now, of course, he's not going to look at this, but he's going to have three different dates that are given as a commencement. He's going to be given 677 BC, and this is going to be the 2520 that ends in 1844, but he originally says 43. And then he's going to have uh, another date, 508, right? And 508 is going to give him two time prophecies that end here, right? You're also going to have the 1290 as well as this. I mean, so this is going to be connected. So 508, that's going to be. It's going to have two time prophecies, but primarily he looks at the 1335 that ends in 1843. And then he's going to have the 2300 days. Oops, so I'm not going to give you the starting date. 457 BC, right? And that's going to be the 2300 days that again ends in 1843 in his understanding of them. Do you have the Great Jubilee as well? The which? The Great Jubilee. Okay, that's going to be later. So I'm, I'm just talking about in 1818. This is what he sees in 1818. Okay, when does he come up with the Great Jubilee? Well, that's going to be quite a bit later. At the 1830s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's going to start preaching in 1833, and and during that time he's going to continue studying. So exactly when he comes up with those, I don't know. But this is this is what he tells us about what he understood in 1818, right? The first prophecy he came up with was the 2520, 
right? This would have been the second, this would have been the third. But he's going to have them all end in 1843. Now, two of them are affected by the fact that there's no zero year um, between BC and AD. So this one's not going to be affected on the 1843 chart. But, and, and we're going to deal with all of these things in more detail later. Right now, what we can see is that we have this darkness, and then we're going to have this increase of light. And you need a fulfillment of prophecy in order to have this happen. That is, is God is not just randomly creating reform lines. These are all part of a structure, a prophetic structure. And we can have individual reform lines. There's minor reform lines that occur which in, within each reform line. But in order to have an increase of knowledge or an increase of light, you need darkness. And that darkness is also a part of a prophecy. Right? We, we can see that this period of papal darkness, we often call it Thyatira. That's how you spell it, Thyatira. doesn't look right. There's a Y instead of I. Ah, there we go. There we go, Thyatira. There? Did I do that right? That doesn't look right. How's it spelled? Um, How it T H. Do I put a Y or an I here? I'm just checking. <laughs> I normally have spell check. Yeah, T H Y. It's a Y or T H Y A T I R A. Like this. I think, I think it was right. Okay, that looks right. Now it looks right. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. So we have this Thyatira, and Thyatira is um, the fourth church, right? And darkness is going to exist in this fourth church. And we're going to deal with that later, the progressive, progressive destruction of four, how we end up with this darkness. And that's what I was going to do. I was going to go through all the progressive destructions of four, uh, but I thought we should actually address um, just this basic idea that we have this darkness, and then we have a time of the end, an end of a time prophecy. And that end of a time prophecy also brings about a reformer, but that reformer is just beginning to receive light. Right? He doesn't come, you know, with a full understanding of everything. He is now experiencing this increase of light, and then that increase of light is going to be um, so this all this history is this increase of light. Now what we're gonna get next after an increase of light is we're gonna have that message being put together in some way so that it can be delivered. So Miller has this understanding here in 1818. When does he start telling people about this light? It's about 1831. Yeah, so it's going to be 1831. Now, sometimes, you know, we put 1831 and then we put 1833 because here he's going to receive his credentials, but he's first asked to present his message in 1831. And, and this is, you know, this we often talk about as the formalization of a message. So a message arrives here, and now it's formalized. It's put into a, into a form that now it can be presented. And so from 1833, uh, Miller is going to be a Baptist preacher, and he's going to be presenting his message to all different kinds of churches that Christ is going to come about the year 1843. We also, and I'm just skipping over some of this, some of the detail here of other things that are happening, but when he gives this message, is it, is it empowered? And 
and I know just throwing this in if somebody's not really familiar with this. So Miller is giving this message. It's a powerful truth in and of itself, but it needs to be empowered. What does that mean? Or like a witness to it. Okay, so it needs another witness, right? So here we have these events of the prophecy, right? They're going to lead Miller to study these truths. So he has this increase of knowledge, this increase of light. And now he's going to have a message to give. And he's going to give that message, but it needs a second witness. Now, what we understand is that August 11th, 1840, is the empowerment of Miller's message. That is, he has set down some rules about Bible study, and he's interpreted these prophecies based on a day for a year principle. But now, using that principle, Revelation 9 is going to be studied, and a prediction is going to be made. And that prediction is going to be fulfilled. And with the fulfillment of that prediction become, comes an empowerment of the message. So in that period from 1840 to, we'll put October 22, 1844, you're going to have this period of 1,533 days, which is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And so this period of time here is is different than this period of time. Now, in this period of time, what is what is Miller doing for the most part? He's a Baptist preacher. What's he doing as far as giving this message? He's just traveling around churches. So he's going to churches on his own. Now, we saw this happen with Jeff as well, right? Jeff just used to be invited to churches to speak, a lot of them in, in, in Spanish-speaking countries. Yes. But he doesn't have any, any backing, really. And that's not going to happen until, what, 1838? Right? Yeah, I think it's... Uh... You have maybe like Himes joining him around that time as well, I think. And yeah. In in 1838? Around that time, not too sure exactly. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, around that time. So you're going to have Joshua V. Himes, and Himes is going to uh, create, you know, basically he's going to fund it and he's going to create um, some uh, periodicals, which Miller didn't have. He had, he had his sermons printed out that he could – um, give those out at meetings. But, um, you know, Himes is going to uh, create some periodicals, particularly the Signs of the Times, known as Himes, Himes Signs of the Times. And um, so that Signs of the Times is going to be uh, the main periodical that's going to promote this message. And, and in that periodical is where we're going to find this prediction uh, regarding August 11th, 1840, at least its final one, because there's going to be, originally, there's going to be uh, Josiah Litch in 1838, and, and he's going to publish a book where he talks about this. So you got Litch, and, and in his book, he's going to talk about the, in August that this is going to be fulfilled. But then it's going to be in the Signs of Times, uh, August 1st, but they're then going to predict August 11th. So, and it's going to take them time before they know that it's been fulfilled. So he, he doesn't necessarily know all the things going on. He just knows that it's going to be fulfilled in August, about two years before that. And then he finally nails it down with a final date. And this we call the empowerment of the message. And, and then this message is, is promoted um, in a big way. 
So this is an important part of a reform line, that there is a time of the end, an event that's prophetic that marks that time of the end, and it's usually going to be a time prophecy of some sort. Um, and then there's going to be this increase of knowledge. And, and along with that, there is a messenger who's going to have this light given to him. But it, it can't just end there. He has to eventually become part of, there's a movement because this is a great reformatory movement. And so it starts with this one individual who's going to listen to God. And then he's going to give this message. And, you know, in this whole history, there's a lot more to it because that's going to go to the end of everything. So you're kind of skipping out all those details of, of what happens because he, Miller is actually predicting a date here, which would be ultimately it's going to be April 18, 1843. That's where Miller's prediction will end. All right, so, but I just wanted to put that 1533 in there. So Miller's prediction is going to end on, on, you know, midnight probably for them in 1843. Um, so when they get to April 19th, they're disappointed. They expected Christ to return, and he hasn't returned, right? So there's going to be, it's October 22, not 2. <clears throat> So these characteristics of a reform line, this increase of light, is, is happening all along the reform line. Because often we just look at it as being right here. Here's the increase of light. 1818, he has this light. But as we noted, as he continues to study, more and more light comes. So there is darkness all along a reform line. Okay, and any thoughts on what we see here? I know I, I try to make things simple. Anything else we're missing? I just looked at the age of William Miller when he was 16. Yeah. So he would be 5,844 days old. So basically it's 4,000 years plus 1844. So 5,844 days. Okay, that's interesting. So 4,000 days more than 1844 days. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I really have tried to find on the internet if I could get like uh, a PDF or something of that copy, of his copy of uh, Cruden's Concordance, but I haven't been able to find one. I don't know if somebody can go down to, uh, you know, wherever his concordance is and look in the cover there for me, that'd be good. But uh I'm thinking that it would probably either be on his birthday or on Christmas that he would. You maybe phone up the place at his museum or whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, see if I could get Yeah. I, I've, I've thought of doing that. We could write somebody a letter too. But we know he got it in 1798. And so there must be a date in there that tells us that. Um, you would think normally you get a Bible given you're going to have dates written in it, but nobody's ever mentioned it on the internet yet. Okay. Um, so the idea that we have this darkness and we have this end of a time prophecy, and then we have an increase of knowledge or an increase of light. Um, what what is required for this increase of of knowledge or increase of light besides the event of a time prophecy
So we get Miller, but what's what's the significance of Miller? Well, God has chosen him. Okay, God's chosen him. Now, the question is, why is Miller a deist? He's influenced by his peers. Okay. And but why are his peers deists? There was the French Revolution philosophy okay. about that time and the okay. Enlightenment. Okay. So, we, so one of the things we see is because of this papal darkness and the word of God being obscured, is that going to lead to the French Revolution? It is. Yeah, okay. Because if God's word had been represented pro properly, we wouldn't have the French Revolution. Right? Mm -hmm. But God's word has been obscured. The thing that uh, the truth has been lost. And in response to that, you know, the papacy itself is going to be attacked by this philosophy in a sense which it, it has propagated. It, the, the, the papacy is going to be turned on by, because of its work that it has done. And you're going to have the French Revolution. And now you have these philosophies that are occurring because of this period of darkness. And then Miller himself, he's chosen, but he's, he's given a concordance at the time of the end. And now he has to be converted. Now, is this common that the person who's picked has to be converted? It was the case with Paul. What's that? It was a case with the Apostle Paul. Yeah, the Apostle Paul. What about Moses? He had to spend 40 years in the wilderness, right? Yes. Ending sheep. Yeah, you're going to find that there is not always described, but at least implied often. Uh, that an experience happens with this person that is is chosen. I mean, we don't we don't really know much about Noah what he personally experienced, um, but we see it in others. And even in Christ, in his reform line, he goes through uh, the signs of the conversion. He's going to be baptized, for instance. Now he's not a sinner, but he, in a sense has to go through a, a process that is related to an increase of light in his personal life. We see this when he's 12 years old and he goes uh, to the temple at the time of the Passover, and he understands his mission more clearly than he did before. So even with Christ, there is an increase of knowledge. He's going to have to grow up to be a man, right? I mean, he has to be born which is kind of akin to being born again. He's just born once. But but you see what I'm saying? That the person chosen has to go through an experience themselves. So Miller has his own personal reform line. He's not just, you know, this godly man who's chosen at the time of the end. He's somebody who has to go through an experience, and that experience is what prepares him. Uh, to give this message. He personally receives this increase of knowledge. Right? And we see this with Jeff as well. So anytime we're looking at a reform line, uh, we're looking at a, a period of darkness that precedes it, a time of the end that marks it, a an event that is fulfilled that marks that time of the end. We're going to see uh, a reformer that's chosen and this reformer has to go through an experience because he's in that darkness and he comes out of that darkness but with this increase of light. And then his experience is going to lead to a proclamation of that message. First, 
a formalization of that message, putting it together, and then, uh, and that formalization can show up in different kinds of ways. And then he's going to have that message um, through some kind of prophecy in some other way, some witness, a second witness, that it's going to be empowered. And then that reformer's work will be completed. And, and that's going to be the end of the reform line. Now, there's more regarding the second angel's message um, of how that comes about. But the, the messenger is really involved in the first angel's message. So in understanding a reform line, these are some very basic details that need to be put together. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just didn't have my speaker turned on. <clears throat> I had to change uh, to the other computers. I'm not going to do this setup again. It's too awkward. Now, um, Any, any questions about this time of the end and the increase of light? Is there new ideas there for people? So hopefully people can see this much more clearly. I don't have many people here today to discuss this, but thanks, Stephen, for your participation and Angela and Iran. Um, so hopefully we can see this a bit more clearly on, on the importance of these reform lines. And we're going to go over these things again as we build upon this. Um, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Yeah, just it's good to go over it again. Just yeah. To refresh. Yeah, and, and we do see some more details than we thought about. At least I did. Going over it again. Um, you know, now in presenting it, I, I, I see I could present it differently, a little bit differently. Um and one of the things that we need to look at a bit more is the time of the ends themselves, what that particularly means, you know, which I didn't. I kind of skipped that. We just kind of put it there, um, said it's an end of a time prophecy, but there is a bit more about the time of the end itself, what that means, and, and how it's related to the increase of light. We touched on that. But hopefully we can see that this darkness, the time of the end, the increase of light are or something that, you know, we could call it a cause and effect. Okay, so let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the study this afternoon. We just pray for those watching this video that they will receive a blessing. Help us to understand these things so that we can share them with others. Watch over each person. Bring us together again to study your word is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>